The East Ham Historical Society welcomes you to the 1869 Schoolhouse Museum. Located right across from the Cape Cod National Seashore Park's Visitor Center on the corner of Nosset and Schoolhouse Roads, the museum is a living memorial to East Ham's first school and its pupils and teachers throughout its nearly 70 years of operation. This short video will introduce you not only to the one-room schoolhouse, but to several significant exhibits that honor the peoples and places in East Ham's 400 plus year history. Let's go inside and take a short tour. Patty Donahoe and Marka Daly, both volunteers with the Historical Society, will be your hosts. It looks like we have some young visitors. I love showing the schoolroom to children. Come in. Hello. What's your name? Nate. And yours? Eva. Have you ever been in a one-room schoolhouse, an old one? No. No. Okay, well let's see what we see. So this schoolroom was built over a hundred and fifty years ago. My sixth grade teacher was Otto Nickerson, a very well-known teacher and principal, and he describes what it was like to teach in this classroom, this very room. He had three grades. Here's what he says. That's good the old way it was. I had my little platform. I didn't have enough time to stand. I had the whole lot of busy with three grades to keep. You know, not only have one reciting, but to know what the other two were doing in the meantime to keep things going. But I really enjoyed it. Here are some desks. Do you have desks like this in your school? No. What's different? Why are there ch chalkboards instead of pieces of paper? Why are there chalkboards? Because that's what they wrote on. Every desk had a chalkboard. <gasps> What's this? The American flag. The American flag. And here's another one. And there's a little bit of difference between the two. Can you tell what it is? That one is kind of skinnier than the other one. Mm-hmm. And if you count the stars, this one only has 37, and this one has 48. There were 37 states when the schoolhouse opened in 1869, and there were 48 states when it closed in 1936. What do you think this is? An old globe. It's an old globe. You're absolutely right. And the the, one? these are some old maps on the wall. They're very old. Before they, they had globes, did they have maps? Yes. They had, globes and maps have been around for a long time. What's this? Oh, what's this? Do you know? No, no, what's I, this? It looks like a witch's cauldron. A witch's cauldron. It's a pot-bellied stove. And do you know why they had that? Why? Because the boys in the class would put wood in the stove and the smoke would go up the chimney and the wood would heat and that's the only heat they had for the whole room in the winter time. So if you were sitting in this desk right here, would you be warm or cold? Really warm. Really warm. 
And if you were in a desk at the front of the room, up here, and the stove is back there, you would be frozen. You'd be frozen. And this is the teacher's desk. We'll leave Nate and Eva for a little while and go into the main exhibit room of the museum where Patty will take over the tour. She will introduce you to the first peoples who inhabited this land for thousands of years. To the Mayflower settlers who arrived in 1620 and to the families who settled here. She'll also show you our exhibit on one of East Ham's most renowned sea captains, Captain Edward Penniman. Here's a bird's eye view of our exhibition room, which shows just some of these exhibits. But let's listen to Patty. In this room, you will see two of our newest exhibits, especially designed to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower passengers landing on Cape Cod. The first exhibit consists of three cases and a wall display, all sponsored by a grant from the Cape Daughters of the American Revolution, Captain Joshua Gray, Jonathan Hatch Chapter. The exhibit includes photos of local Wampanoag tribe members, a 1605 map of Nauset Harbor, and various artifacts that illustrate aspects of daily life for native peoples. The basket and pot were made by Carrie Helm using traditional pre-contact designs. The first people to inhabit the Lower Cape arrived at the end of the Ice Age as the glaciers were receding about 12,000 years ago. We have over a thousand artifacts in our collection that show evidence of their presence over time, mostly projectile points and other stone items. Our oldest artifact, a Hardaway point, is estimated to be between 9,000 and 10,000 years old. Archaeologist Zen Zoto has identified and cataloged three of the four collections. A few of these items are featured, as well as several on loan from the National Seashore Collection. At the time of first contact with the English explorers, in December of 1620, there were more than 1,000 Nauset Indians living in Weetus, or wigwams, here. About 3,000 Wampanoag still live on Cape Cod today. We now move from the first peoples who inhabited this area to the first English settlers who came to the Cape seeking religious freedom and economic opportunity. Among the 102 English passengers on their ship, the Mayflower, there were three young people, Constance Hopkins, 14, her brother Giles, 12, and Joseph Rogers, 18. The Mayflower passengers are listed on the wall above the case, and the three young people noted by a small image of a ship beside their name. As adults, they would eventually leave Plymouth and make their homes in East Ham. All are interred in the Cove Burying Ground, located on Route 6. Both groups came together on a snowy morning, December 8th, 1620, when the Nauset Indians and about 16 English settlers in the Mayflower Exploring Party, led by Miles Standish, encountered one another on what we now call First Encounter Beach. Arrows flew and muskets were fired, but neither side suffered any casualties. They would live amongst one another in relative peace for the next 50 years. In April 1644, seven English settlers left Plymouth to establish homes on the Lower Cape. These men, with the last names of Prince, Doan, Snow, Cook, Higgins, and Smalley, and Bangs, were outnumbered by the natives, 49 to 500 plus, built houses, fished, 
planted crops, and prospered with the help of their indigenous neighbors. Many of their descendants still live on the Cape today. Here are their family trees. We offer these for sale, $10, at the museum to descendants and other interested parties. Although not descended from one of the original seven families, whaling captain Edward Penniman and his wife Augusta were a remarkable couple who made their home in East Ham. Together, they traveled the world on seven different whaling voyages with their three children, Eugene, Betsy, Bessie, and Edward, Ned, making acquaintances with the king and queen of the Sandwich Islands, later Hawaii, other sea captains and sailors, and returning at last to East Ham, where they built a magnificent home. The house remained in the family until 1963, when the Penniman's granddaughter, Irma Brown, sold the property to the National Park Service. Tours of Penniman House are conducted during the summer months. While free, reservations are required due to a limit on the number of participants. Susan Abbott's film, A History of Captain Penniman, Whaling Captain, Gentleman Farmer, and East Ham Citizen, can be viewed on the EHS YouTube channel. These items are presently on loan from the National Park Service. Augusta's Crazy Quilt, Edward Penniman's shaving mirror, razor, and mug, Ned's Hawaiian doll, bone cross, and shell encrusted shelf, a gift from the Hawaiian princes, likely Princess Liliuokalani, later Queen Liliuokalani, carved likeness of Captain Penniman. Items from our collection. Captain Penniman's treasure box, glass kitchen lamp, Daniel Penniman's Bible, Chapel in the Pines Ledger. About the same time Captain Penniman was hunting whales in the Arctic, his little brother was engaged in a different sort of battle with his regiment, the Union 33rd Infantry, in the mountains of northern Georgia. This is a crayon painting of Private Francis William Penniman. Francis was wounded at the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, but was expected to recover. He was sent to Chattanooga by train, and according to Brad Quinlan, park historian, the train ride caused an infection in his lungs, and he died at the 23rd Army Corps Field Hospital, July 8, 1864. Francis is buried in the Chattanooga National Cemetery. Henry Beston is another well-known East Ham name, and this exhibit pays homage to the man and his great literary classic, The Outermost House, published in 1928. The book itself, a chronicle of a solitary year of life on the great beach of Cape Cod, pays homage to the devastating beauty and power of the Atlantic Ocean. The house, dubbed the Focusal by Beston, was built by East Ham carpenter Harvey Moore in the late spring of 1925. One of several beach camps, it was located two miles south of Nauset Coast Guard Station with the Atlantic Ocean near its front door and Nosset Marsh behind it. At times, Beston's only neighbors were the Coast Guardsmen who patrolled the beach. Our exhibit includes a replica of the 20 foot by 16 foot house, an oil painting by local artist George Sutton, photos of its interior and remnants and relics. Here, you'll see a collage made from a shingle from the house, and photos of the kitchen, Beston's writing desk, and his famous chair on loan from the Massachusetts Audubon in Wellfleet. Look up and you'll discover the chair 
on the wall above your head. Over the years, the focusal was moved several times to avoid the encroachment of the sea, but it finally succumbed to the hurricane blizzard of 1978, which destroyed all beach camps except one, the Dill Beach Camp. What remained from the focusal was only a corner of the house with the 1964 bronze plaque which recognized it as a national literary landmark. Yet what remains for all who have read Beston's Chronicle and vicariously experienced his year on the outer beach is an enormous respect for the ocean's omnipotence and its devastating beauty. The ocean's omnipotence was also an integral part of daily life for the many ship's captains who had to navigate the treacherous waters off the Cape shores, no matter what the weather. In this little corner of our museum, we have several relics and artifacts, from shipwrecks to whales. Here come Eva and Nate again. Let's see what they have to say about these whale bones. On these little tables, can you see what these are? What do you think they might a be? A bone? It's a bone. Any idea where it might have come from? No. I'll give you a hint. Sometimes we find them on the beaches because they're from a sea animal. A very big sea animal. A whale? A whale! A shark. What do you think this is hanging from the ceiling? A elephant tusk. A whale bone. An, ele an elephant's tusk or a whale bone? It's a whale bone. Do you know what kind? Where it came from? The mouth. It's from the mouth. It's a jawbone of a whale. And if this is your jawbone right here, this long, imagine how long that whale was. <laughs> yeah, humongous. Whoops. It looks like your parents are waiting for you in the lobby. You go see them, and I'll continue with the adults. We call this corner the ship's wheel corner because the main artifact is a ship's wheel from the Italian bark Castagna that ran aground during a violent storm in February 1914. By the time the lifesavers reached the ship, the captain and cabin boy had already been swept overboard, and several seamen had succumbed to the icy conditions and had literally frozen on board. Several documents and photos tell the story of that rescue and the brave lifesavers who risked their own lives to save the crew and ship. And this brings us to our life-saving exhibit, which focuses on the United States Life-Saving Service, founded in 1848, and which merged with the U.S. Revenue Cutter Service to become the U.S. Coast Guard in 1915. As we've already seen, Cape waters were dangerous for sailors, and the brave men of the Life-Saving Service and Coast Guard risked their own lives to save the lives of many others. This map shows the locations of the Cape's 14 life-saving stations. And the smaller dots around the edge of the Cape indicate the principal shipwrecks in a span of 50 years. Just imagine. The exhibit highlights the method most used by the lifesavers, the breaches buoy method, which was conducted from the shore using an elaborate system of ropes, pulleys, life rings, and other apparatus that was hauled to the wreck site by cart. Some important components of the breaches buoy rescues were the faking box and shot line, a box with a coiled rope 
that would not get tangled when shot to the vessel. The Lyle gun was a small cannon which shot a projectile to which the line was attached. And the line carried the tally boards, which had instructions in both English and French for how to attach the line to the mast in order to be strong enough for the most important piece of the rescue, the eponymous breeches buoy. This particular photograph is from the rescue of the crew of the ship Northern Pacific in 1919. But besides the means of rescue, the exhibit also features the men of the Nauset Life Station. We're almost at the end of our tour, but we can't omit another corner of the museum, one that features other means of transportation, by land and air, as well as by sea. Many visitors don't know that East Ham once had an airfield, as well as two train depots. These once busy hubs are long gone now, but some of us still remember the little airport behind the area where the Fairway restaurant now stands and the two railway stations. East Ham was at the intersection of Samoset Road and the Cape Cod Rail Trail, named for the railroad tracks that were torn up and later became the bike trail. And Northeast Ham, down on Railroad Avenue. Today, only the place names, such as Briggsfield Road, Railroad Ave, Depot Road, or Depot Pond, offer clues to the East Ham of bygone days. But the museum has a wonderful scale model of the East Ham Depot and buildings made by Jim Seabolt. Enjoy the detail of this model. Hear the birds singing and imagine yourself in an older, less hectic East Ham. We are so lucky to have the East Ham Historical Society and its museums to help preserve these bits of history so that visitors in the present and future can learn from and appreciate East Ham's past. I know that two little visitors today, at least, enjoyed their visit to the Schoolhouse Museum. We'll say goodbye to Nate and Eva, and we'll hope to see you at our museum in person in the not-so-distant future. I hope you enjoyed your time with us, did you? Yes. Okay, come back again soon. Okay. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. You're very welcome. Bye, thank you. Historical information and most photos are from the archives of the East Ham Historical Society. Other photos and videos, courtesy of Marka Daly, with special thanks to East Ham 400, Plymouth Plantation, the Wellfleet Audubon, and the Cape Cod National Seashore Park. We hope you enjoyed this short tour of the 1869 schoolhouse and thank you for your continued support.